appreciate you being here for our morning worship service. It is important as Christians to keep a guilty conscience, to keep a convicted conscience. If we don't continue walking in the light, if we stop noticing that what we sow today will reap for us tomorrow, we fail to recognize that our actions not only can impact us today, but obviously down the road, they'll touch us and our families and others potentially as well. This morning's lesson, I want us to think about a passage that is coming from Romans chapter 1. And for those who will be watching us on our stream, turn with me to Romans, the first chapter. And I want to begin uh, looking at verses 24 through 32. What happens to an individual if they lose a convicted conscience? What is a convicted conscience? It's your conscience that says, this is right, this is wrong. If I do this, this will be the correct result. If I do this, it hurts God, it hurts me, it potentially hurts my family. That is what is going to reap a whirlwind for myself in eternity if I don't deal with it. The Bible tells us a, the Bible gives us a shocking reality about what the Father does to individuals whose mind is fully given to corruption. In verses 24 and 25, here's what it says in the beginning. God gave them up to uncleanliness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than their creator, who is blessed forever. The point came in first century society, and we recognize today we could perhaps be in the same situation today, where mankind just decides, you know what, I'm doing the ways of the flesh. I'm going to pursue a lie that my mind begins to be filled with thoughts and ways of the world that simply aren't so when you consider it in the eyes of God. Because of their rejection of God from their knowledge, God the Bible says, gave them up. What does that mean? That's a scary thought. That a man and a woman can reach a point in their spiritual life where God gives them up. Let's think about that. Because today I don't want to walk out the door and say, has God given up on me? Now let's understand a disclaimer here. God is always available for us. God is willing to receive us, to offer salvation to us for as long as we draw breath and have a cognitive mind and know what we're doing. God will receive us. Salvation is available. But in its proper context, the Bible also says that sin can lead us down a road to where God just looks at us and says, I give up on you. That's a scary thought. What does that mean in its context? He quit trying to keep them from hurting themselves. He pulled back his providential restraints on individuals. They went first to uncleanliness. What does that word in Greek mean? It means unnatural pollution. It carries the idea of being morally defiled. The consciousness isn't pricked anymore. They went to uncleanliness because of the lusts that were found in their own hearts. And when there is no thought of God, think about it. What's got to replace it? Something does. If God is not in my heart, if God is not in my mind, something else is going to go there. And the and defilement is what does that. Evil, Satan. Man will replace thoughts of God with pleasures of self. They found pleasure in the first century in sexual acts with one another. And this was all because of verse 25, it says they changed the truth of God into a lie. Simply put, people can live in a false reality to what the Word of God says. That this is what I perceive life to be like, but you're totally off the reservation to what is reality with God. And that's what they did in the first century. What makes a person go down a road of defilement? Living a lie. That what you think is fine and good, in God's eyes, you're way off the reservation with reality. This was all because they changed the truth of God into the lies of idolatry. You know, I would dare say, um, you know, all of us fight idols. 
You know, we're not talking about statues of a made thing, right, Grant? We're talking about idols of, it could be money, it could be people, it could be events, it could be things, of course. But if we don't watch those things, even comfort can be an idol, can it not? Sure it can. Feelings can become an idol. We have to be aware of what was happening in the first century. Idols are created by man, and they make us go in the direction in which we love them. It naturally bled into Gentile society. They served themselves. It says they led to serving the creature rather than the creator. And that's what he could do for us. And so God gave them up to uncleanliness. That's a scary thought that God gets to the point with an individual where he goes, I'm not going to stop you from living the lie you've chosen to live. That's a scary thought because God is not going to force us to love him. That's the, the beauty of free moral agency. Today, I come because I want to worship God. I want to give to him. Look at what he's made. Look at what he continues to do, what he has done. I want to give my first fruits to God today, my first offering to God, the best. But at some point, if I don't watch my life and the truth of God, I will live in a false sense of reality, and God will give me up to that reality that I think he is, that isn't. Number two, let's continue looking at what happens then. In verses 26 to 27, for this cause, as we just highlighted in 24 and 25, for this cause, God gave them up. Again, it's reiterated here from verse 24. God gave them up to vile affections. For even the women changed the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust toward one another, men with men, working that which is harmful, or the word there unseemly is shameful, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was consequences or consequential. So eventually what it leads to, if there is a defilement in my, in my mind about morality, it leads me to homosexuality. For this cause of idolatry, God gave them up to shameful passage. You see, what's the next step in the journey downward in sin? Homosexuality is what Paul highlights in Romans chapter 1. Heterosexual behavior is the norm. There is no such thing as people are born with it. God sees it as a sin, does he not? Man says it's a civil rights issue. Are you going to live with reality? It's a sin. And if, we're still, if the world is still here in 2,000 years, can I tell you something? It's still a sin. You know, the world calls us Bible thumpers. I'm careful not to use that word, but I think we've reached the point where I think the world needs Bible thumpers. To just say, hey, yeah, I can give you book, chapter, verse, it's wrong. Well, you're a Bible thumper. I think we need that. I don't know any religious people that are. Now you got religious people. You don't thump the Bible. Maybe we should. Do you think living in this false reality is acceptable? The whole world goes, God says, I'll give you up. So we've got to thump. We've got to tell folks, hey, there is a reality. This is not a born behavior. This is a learned behavior. And we have to tell folks the reality is there is truth, there is sin, and there are consequences to it. To try to replace it, reverse it, frame it, however you want to frame it in your mind, God says this is still not going to change the reality. The women change their natural use of their body. Women are supposed to be with men, men with women. Well, the men did change their course of their natural use as well. And all of this was because they were wrapped up in their own lust. Brethren and friends, I, I beg you, and those watching us, we have to keep our fleshly with spiritual war in check. All of us have that. We deal with a spiritual fleshly war. Okay? Don't think it's just sexual. Think about the, the extent of what we're talking about. We war with the flesh's pleasure. Our body would tell us, go for pleasure, go for what's comfortable, go for what's easy. But the spirit, the spiritual side says, no, there's a part of me that has to recognize, I'm not going to live in this body forever. One day, and I hate to say this, but with the virus around, you could die tomorrow, honestly. We can't accept that we're just going to get tomorrow by default. So we have to think about what Paul is saying to the Romans and this God gave them up. Can people literally die lost thinking they were absolutely saved? Well, doesn't he say on the day of judgment, right at him, he says, many are going to come to me on that day? And so what helps me stay in check 
If say, I've read my Bible. God lists sins. God lists what is acceptable. Okay, I'm convicted by that. Great. That's what the Bible meant to do. And if I keep that convicted conscience, it keeps me on the right path, and I'm going to sow the right seeds, and I'm going to reap the right result, as, as so do. A man named R.L. Whiteside said, When a people cease to respect God, they will no longer respect even their own bodies. Because of their sinful and shameful actions, they received that which was their due. They received a verdict from the Father. They turned from God in their lusts. They were punished. They fell into the depths of sexual sins. Their lifestyles caused them pain and grief. Have you ever looked at, and I mean this regrettably, have you seen people who live in a festering pool of sin ever be happy? Have you ever seen them? I don't. They look dejected, depressed, Honestly, the word I look for is desperate. I don't know what to do. I can tell you what to do. You need to get right with God first. Yes, I'm Bible thumping because we need it. You need to understand the scriptures, see that God loves you, see that he's ready to accept you just like the prodigal son. And we need to live the right way. And we need to live convicted about the right way. Not just that's just how we do it. No, understand why we do it. Why do we live righteously, folks? Have you ever thought about it? Why do I want to live righteous? Because I've seen from the Old and New Testament what happens to people when they choose to go the wrong path. It has no positive end whatsoever. If you would look at verses 28 through 32 then. What happens in this roller coaster ride? In verse 28 then. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over. See, there's it used again a third time. God gave them over to a reprobate mind, to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, see that's an interesting thing, verse 20, verse 32, they know the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only to do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So because they completely abandoned God, folks, they were allowed to be without any sense of judgment of right and wrong. This morning, if you have a convicted conscience, that's a good thing. You know, if I, I'm ashamed I spoke bad, I back taught my mom. You know what? I'm glad you at least admit that. Children, I hope you feel bad if you are mean to your mom and dad. You should. You should feel bad when you listen to your dad and he tells you something and you don't do it. You say, I, I feel bad that I do that because my daddy would not want me to do that. A convicted conscience helps me go, you know what? There is a right way and there is a wrong way and I have to see the reason to do it the right way. So in Romans chapter 1, they lived only to do that which pleased them. They did whatever they wanted, even if it was not proper. The word, that's the word of convenient. They do it even if it isn't proper. Paul then says that they were filled with a number of things. And we list all of those that were extremely sinful. But let's look at a few of them. King James doesn't really give us the full measure of the context here. But this helps me as a Christian. I hope it will help you. We hear that word debate. They, they come to a point of saying words debate. That word in Greek means, refers to contention and strife. It's connected with anger and hatred. Today, if you have those qualities, I should, I shouldn't say qualities, if you have those attributes or those, those feelings, there is a way to remedy that. There is a way to go to God and say, God, I have dealt with anger and hatred for a long time. Maybe it's with an individual. Maybe it's with a group. Maybe it's with a certain result that occurred in your life, there is a way to rid yourself of that problem so that you don't wake up every day with it on your heart and lingering. Find the remedy, seek it out with God, pray to Him about it, leave it in His care and say, God, you're the one who handles that. I trust you to take care of me with it. The Bible says that they were given over to malignity. This is putting the worst thoughts together about someone's actions of conduct. Let me tell you, Remember what Paul said in Philippians, I believe chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, or verse 4, or verse 8. He says, whatever things, you know, that's a lovely or good report. You know what he says at the end of that verse? 
think on these things. Let me tell you, if you don't put positive thoughts in your mind, I can tell you what you're going to put in there. Oh, the devil will, right? Negative thoughts. That's what the word malignity means. The devil wants you to leave here. I don't like people. I don't like life. I don't like anything. Well, he's got you. There are some wonderful, wonderful things to be grateful for, isn't there? Replace those thoughts with good thoughts. Replace that ingratitude with thankfulness. Come to realize, you know, my father does love me. I can't help what other people do, but I can help myself. Because if I keep a convicted conscience, it's going to help me not turn to malignity, where all I do is to put the worst thoughts possible in my mind and live with that result. Paul also says whisperers, those who are quietly talking bad about people. You know, we all can say there are good and bad with people. But let's notice there are good in people. People have their faults, but they have good. It says that they were inventors of evil. Can you imagine, Adam, amazingly, that man can reach a point to where they invent new ways to do evil? My mind can reach that point where I don't have a conscience about doing bad. In fact, whatever my buddy does and as wild as he is, I'll try to top it. Have we really reached the point to where we do evil to invent it in a new form? Without natural affection. You know what natural affection means in particularly with the context? It means have no love for offspring. I was talking to one brother here, and he said, I don't know how people can throw babies into a dumpster and let them die there in a bag without natural affection. It's called a reprobate mind. It's where the mind loses all sense of consciousness, all sense of this is right, here's the reason it's right, I believe in that right, or this is wrong, I know it's wrong, and I feel bad when I commit that wrong. You see, a reprobate mind knows no judgment. If it feels good to me, I'm going to do it. I don't care if it's wrong or right. I'm just going to do it. And God gave them over to this way of thinking. And what folks do is they live in this life thinking that that's reality. And God gives them over. So today, if I walk out the door, I could ask, has God given me up? Well, do I really have a conviction for the Word of God? I mean, he talks about being faithful to him. He talks about worship. He talks about serving. He talks about refraining from this sin and that sin. Have I been walking in that way? Have I noticed the right way? Have I noticed what's wrong and what that does? That's important, brother. And I hope that you're asking yourself those questions because that keeps us from developing a reprobate mind where it's just what's convenient feels good to me. So without natural affection, it's prevalent. You know, they used to do a lot of child sacrifices back in the ancient world. This is one Bible example. Um, I think it was Molech. Um, they would extend the hands of a false god. And this was Israel doing this. And they would heat the bottom of the hands so hot to this false god that a band would play on behalf of Israel. So that when the baby's sitting there, you know, you can imagine. But it's in the Bible. They're screaming out of this being burned to death. And they play the band so that they wouldn't hear the kids scream. A reprobate mind. And folks, that's in the Bible. If I don't have a conviction, I can do something like that and it doesn't bother me. And we ask ourselves, why does society, they do this, they do, it doesn't seem to bother them. That's the reprobate mind. So brethren, I know it's a strong lesson and it's meant to hopefully impact us in a positive way where it says, I'm convicted by the Word of God. I love the Word of God. I see why it's the way it is. It prevents child sacrifice. It prevents me from driving drunk and thinking about my living responsibly. It prevents me from, from walking in life thinking I don't have to be answered to anybody. But I am, a, I am a living salt example of Christ. That's what I'm supposed to be. It keeps me on that path. No, I'm not perfect, but hey, let me tell you about this. Christ died for us all, amen? Let me tell you about him. That's good. These are good thoughts. The word implacable, it says that a reprobate mind reaches a point to where, and that word in its Greek word means to never seek an end to a quarrel, always wanting more. You know, there are some people in life who want a quarrel to never end. That's what implacable means. I don't want it to end. It's kind of, I like it. Implacable. Can we ever say, you know what, I've been dealing with this back and forth for 30 years. It is time to lay that deal forever to rest. I don't know about them, but I know what I can do. And I'm going to find a way to close that door on that situation. And I'm moving forward. Because I don't want to be implacable. 
I just don't want that fight to ever end because that's not going to help me. Though they had refused to acknowledge God as I close, they refused to acknowledge God, the Bible tells us, the knowledge of God never completely left them. That's an interesting thought to me because verse 32 says, who knowing the judgment of God, they knew what God was going to do. It says they didn't forget God, they just chose to take the knowledge they knew and do nothing with it. They knew God hated these things and God would stand against them because of these things. But even in the depths of the sin, they knew the things they were doing was wrong. However, it didn't bother them. And for all those reasons, God gave them. So this morning as we extend the invitation, if you need to come forward, I am happy to, to welcome you to this front pew. Have a seat. If you want to pray for something that's been bothering you, for a sin you've committed, I hope you have a conviction today. I want to do what's right. I want to live right. I want to be right with God. You can. You can be forgiven, washed in the watery grave of baptism for the forgiveness of your sins, or you can come and be restored. But whatever the need, don't leave without being right with God. Live with conviction. That's great. We all should. So whatever your need, as we extend the invitation, won't you come if you have any need at this time?